Okay, it is 10 a.m. Eastern. It may be a different time for you, uh, but either way, I just want to welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you all so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. My name is Kayla Ripple and I'm a senior associate with the Lenfest Ocean Program. So for those of you who may not know us, the Lenfest Ocean Program is a grant making program that funds research projects and expert working groups to address priority needs facing ocean and coastal decision makers today. You can learn more about us at our website at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Lenfest Ocean. In fact, we'll be live tweeting this event today, so feel free to interact with us there too if you'd like. Uh, today, we're excited to have joining us Drs. Ellen Pickage and Johnny Bohorquez from Stony Brook University to share details of their new paper out now in Science Advances. The paper assessed protected areas and habitats in China's coastal and offshore waters. I'll share the link in the chat in just a second and also a link to its accompanying fact sheet if you'd like to check that out too. But the study cataloged over 300 sites in China's waters. All the data was made publicly available, and it's really the first comprehensive database of area-based marine conservation in China. So I'll let Johnny and Ellen get into the details, but for us at Lenfest, we're excited to see this information get out there. It sheds light on China's history of implementing MPAs, which is a crucial component in understanding progress toward global conservation targets like 30 by 30. We hope this information can help scientists, resource managers, and other stakeholders, both in China and internationally, to inform their future protected area planning. Now, before I turn it over to our speakers, I just wanted to share a few webinar logistics with everyone um, before we get started. And so with so many people on the line, we have all attendees muted to prevent any feedback or echoes. The researchers will do their full presentation, then we'll answer questions at the end. Feel free to submit your question at any time during the webinar using the Q&A panel, um, and I'll be keeping track of those and we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. We realize that there are likely many questions that could fall outside of the scope of this project. And while we can take questions in terms of how this research is relevant to management, we do ask that folks stick to the scope of the project. That's really our area of expertise, and we trust your best judgment in doing that after you hear the presentation. If a question does come up that's beyond the scope, we may not be able to answer this, but as with all things, we'll certainly do the best we can. And depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all today, but folks are certainly welcome to follow up with us. My contact information is on the slide in front of you, and we'll also be sharing the researchers' contact information at the end. So please feel free to follow up and reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send a link to the recording as soon as it's available. And with that, I think I've covered everything. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen and Johnny. Um, Johnny, I think you were gonna share your screen. So you should have the ability to do that now. Let me just really quickly stop sharing my screen so that you can do it. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Kayla, for that lovely introduction. And um, I'm excited to be here today to talk with you about our analysis of China's marine protected areas. Next slide, please. So as Kayla mentioned, um, we recently had a paper come out in the journal Science Advances that describes China's area-based marine conservation efforts. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the co-authors of the study, whose names are listed here, as well as many, many people who contributed along the way to um, our analysis and compilation of the data that we'll be talking about today. I'd also like to thank the Lenfest Ocean Program for supporting this research. Next slide, please. 
So let's start with what is a marine protected area, because this is one of the major forms of area-based marine conservation that China has used. An MPA is a clearly defined geographical space protected by legal or other effective means. And the key here is that the primary goal of an MPA is the conservation of nature. So the intent or the goal is really what puts MPAs in a different category than other types of area-based conservation. Next slide, please. Why do we care about MPAs? Why are we interested in them? Well, I think it's because we now know and we have a wealth of information documenting that when they're carefully cited and well-managed, marine protected areas can have amazing outcomes for both people and nature. In terms of the ecological outcomes, um, they can improve biodiversity, conservation, increase fisheries yields, improve water quality, store carbon, and help with climate resilience. In terms of well being, um, MPAs can protect culture, culturally important places, species, and perspectives. Fishery catches is definitely something that um, is of importance to many people. And they can provide alternative livelihoods. An example would be ecotourism opportunities that arise as a result of MPAs, income, and stakeholder empowerment. While all of these outcomes have been documented in some place or another and in many places, whether or not they occur um, depends very critically on how strongly the MPAs are protected and the enabling conditions that are in place. Next slide, please. This figure comes from a paper I co-authored with 42 other scientists that came out in science in September of this year and was spearheaded by Kirsten Grorud Culver, um, right, okay, of Oregon State University. So to try to make this simple, this figure, this illustration is showing the relationship between the level of protection, the stage of establishment, and how much of, an, of a benefit or an outcome we expect to see. So going across the columns from left to right, we look at stage of establishment, we see committed, designated, implemented, and actively managed. And there's a yellow line, vertical line, between designated and implemented. And that's because the, you know, the authors determined that until an MPA is actually implemented, you really can't expect to see any biodiversity or other outcomes begin to accrue. So we definitely wanna see MPAs that are implemented or better or actively managed um, in order to see good conservation outcomes. Looking down the rows from the top row down, we go from the highest level protection, fully protected marine protected areas, down to, from fully we go to highly, then lightly, then minimally protected. Next slide, please. So, whoops, there you go. Um, so that upper right hand green box is really where we wanna be, highly or fully protected, implemented and or actively managed. These are the types of MPAs that are going to yield the best outcomes for both people and nature. Okay, next slide. Kayla mentioned something about globally agreed protection targets and the sustainable development goals, target 14.5, and something called the Aichi target. Um, both have been in place for a while and they call for 10% of the ocean to be protected by the year 2020. Um, there are negotiations now in place. We're kind of midway between the first meeting and the second meeting, which will occur next spring, which will determine whether or not and what the figure will be for a new globally agreed target by the year 2030. You may have heard a lot about the number 30% by 2030. Um, many individual nations have committed to that, including the United States. But the global, the, we'll have to wait until the spring probably to see whether or not we have a global agreement. But in any case, it's likely to be much higher than 10%. Next slide, please. 
In addition to setting a coverage target, how much of the ocean we should protect, these global, global agreements also talk about ecological representativity as well as other effective area-based conservation measures. So in terms of ecological representativity, we wanna be sure that the marine protected areas that we have covering the ocean are covering um, a representative fraction of all the different ecosystems that exist in the ocean. We don't wanna have them all be in one type of habitat or another type of habitat, but we wanna see good coverage across the spectrum. Another point that um, really I don't think is, is as well known is that there are things called other effective area-based conservation measures. And I apologize for all the acronyms, but it's hard to talk about this subject without, without a lot of alphabet soup. Um, and these OECMs actually now count towards the global targets. So that was determined a couple of years ago in discussions about the Aichi target of 10%. Not only MPAs, but also OECMs will count towards the whether or not the goal has been attained. Next slide. So since I mentioned OECMs, and they're particularly relevant, I think, to the China situation, these are areas that do not qualify as MPAs because their goal is not to protect biodiversity conservation per se. That's not the primary goal. But these are areas that are being managed in such a way that they may produce similar outcomes, both ecological and um, for, for nature, that um, are similar to what we see for marine protected areas. Some examples might be demilitarized zones, offshore wind farms, and select fishery management zones, such as areas that are closed to fishing to protect, um, let's say, habitat or particular groups of species. And these are being increasingly studied and being called for um, by the scientific community. So where do we stand today? There are almost 18,000 marine protected areas in the world, which is quite a large number, but most of them are really, really small. And right now they comprise less than 8% of the total area of the ocean. And most of these, um, not all of these are, are in that sweet spot. In fact, most of them are far from the sweet spot, unfortunately. So the world has not yet reached the 10% goal. Next slide. How did this project come about? You might be wondering, you know, wh where was the genesis for this? And it really does go back several years to a project that the Lenfest Ocean Program su supported on marine fisheries and food security in China. I was an invited participant and we had two workshops in China that brought together Chinese scientists and scientists from around the globe to talk about these issues. And that project culminated in a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it mostly focused on opportunities for marine fisheries reform in China. Even though fisheries was really the main goal of that project, um, during the workshops that we had, someone mentioned China's MPAs. And I was surprised because I had not heard until then that China had marine protected areas. And a lot of the other international scientists also were surprised. And I started to ask, how many MPAs are there? And the first person said, oh, there might be a dozen. And someone said, no, no, you're wrong, it's dozens. And someone said hundreds, and someone said thousands. <laughs> and it was clear that, um, that whatever the number was, it wasn't well known, even in China. And this really intrigued me. And I also got to collaborate with and to know many scientists in China, and in particular, one of the key collaborators on this project, Julia Zhui, and together we hatched this plan to try to learn more about marine protected areas in China. Next slide. Um, what, what are some of the things about China that make it super important to understand? It is the world's most populous nation with 1.4 billion people. It's a huge economy. It's one of the largest countries by landmass, 
It's the fourth most biodiverse country in the world. And in terms of its relationship with the ocean, it's the world's number one fishing nation. It's the largest consumer, consuming nation of both, both wild and farm seafood. It's also the world's largest distant water fishing nation and its catches have been said to comprise about 40% of the global total of distant water catches. And also importantly, China is hosting the Convention on Biological Diversity Convention of Parties, which is, which is the um, convention that will be deciding the next targets for um, ocean protection goals. Next slide. Some of the, the early things we learned about China's marine protected area legacy is that they've had marine protected areas for at least six decades. China has a voluntary goal to protect 5% of its marine and coastal ecosystems. But when you look at internationally available databases, such as, sorry for the acronym, WDPA, which stands for the World Database on Protected Areas, it only has included 15 marine protected areas for the, for the nation of China. And that's been consistent um, at least up until the last time we looked in, last month. There's been, um, there have been speeches given and notes that MPAs may number 270 or more, but there was no publicly available comprehensive database. And so the details of these MPAs and how many there were was very poorly understood. Next slide. So our research goals were threefold. First, again, to develop that all important database, comprehensive and publicly available of all of China's area-based conservation measures. Secondly, to assess how these protected areas are distributed across different habitats within China, to measure the ecological representativeness of China's MPA network. And third, to analyze China's progress towards meeting internationally agreed conservation targets and pathways for improvement. Next slide. So we, we've learned that there are two major types of marine protected areas. The first type is called the Marine Nature Reserve. This is the oldest form of MPA in China, and these are fully no-take. Um, they often have stated in the description of them that they protect some rare or endangered species and ecosystems, but they are fully no-take, so they are conserving the full range of um, biodiversity within their, their borders. The second type of marine protected area are called special marine protected areas. They're a more recent phenomenon. And these are, these are multiple use protected areas. So while they may have um, a core zone where that is fully no-take or highly protected, they also allow other uses, including some fishing, some other, some other activities, um, including ecotourism. And then marine parks are included as a special type of special marine protected area. Next slide, please. China also has another form of area-based conservation called aquatic germplasm reserves. So here's another acronym for your list, AGRs. Some people refer to them as fishery conservation zones. And these are managed by the fisheries agency. And whereas the MPAs are managed by a completely different agency. So there's, there's no overlap in the management structure at, pre, at the present time. Um, they are set to protect, in many cases, commercially important species, rare species, or endangered fish species. And we know that at least some of them are fully no-take. And they may have been set up not to, not to um, protect all of the biodiversity in the area. For example, some may have been set up to protect the spawning ground of a key species. But because many of them, or at least some of them are fully no-take, again, they are, they are likely to be producing strong ecological and human well-being outcomes. So some of these may qualify as OECMs, 
And so the AGRs may count towards the, um, global, the global coverage goals. So the extent to which this is true will depend upon a much more in-depth analysis than we were able to do about which of these AGRs actually qualify as OECMs. Next slide, please. How did we go about pulling together the database? I like to think of it as putting together a jigsaw puzzle, except the jigsaw pieces, the jigsaw puzzle pieces didn't come in one nice box with all the pieces all together. We had to find the pieces and we had to do that from many different sources and in lots of different ways. Once we compiled the data from multiple sources, we had expert consultations, and then we prioritized what type of information um, we felt was the best quality information. If there, were, if there was more than one um, piece of information, let's say, and that it was contradictory for an MPA or an AGR, we would discuss this with experts and um, figure out which was the one, which was the interpretation that was most reasonable. And this way we came up with a bedded list of MPAs and AGRs. Next slide. We also took several, several long trips through China, through most of the coastal areas and visited um, more, than, more than 25 marine protected areas, marine parks. And these site visits encompassed a wide variety of species, some of them shown here, and ecosystems. Next slide. So the full data set, what's in it? What does it look like? It's got the age um, of each MPA or AGR, that is the year it was established, how much area it covers, the location, the stated conservation objectives of each of the MPAs and AGRs. The sources that we used included books. Some of the books that we used were written in Chinese and only available for purchase in China. Um, online government materials. These included, in some cases, press releases announcing the creation of a new MPA. News articles, websites, and again, we went through a structured prioritization for our sources to be sure we had both the most up-to-date and the highest quality sources in our data set. Next slide. So the data are available in a data repository called Dryad. And again, this is open access. The, um, the web link is right here. It's also in the paper, it's repeated in the paper if you're interested in seeing the details of the data. Next slide. So where does China fit in, in terms of the stage of establishment and level of protection? of its MPAs and AGRs. Um, our, best, our best assessment is that the white box on, shown on this figure is a, is a good portrayal of where China is. That is that these are not just simply committed or designated. Um, the vast, vast majority of them are implemented and have been for several years, some of them for up to 60 years. Many of them are actively managed. Whoops, we just lost, um, something just happened. I apologize. Um, do we have this back now? Everything looks good on my end, Ellen. It was just my screen then, sorry. Okay, all okay. good. Great, um, okay. So basically, the vast majority of MPAs and AGRs in China are already implemented or actively managed. And the marine nature reserves, which make up about 68% of the area. Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm going to have to turn this off completely. Um, right. That was the phone I thought I'd turned off. <laughs> I'm sorry again. Right, so the MNRs, the Marine Nature Reserves, the oldest form of MPA in China, um, their area comprises about 68% of the total area of MPAs in the country. So the vast majority of MPAs are no take. 
Um, there's also for the other MPAs, most of them have a no take area within them. So at least two thirds of the area of MPAs in China would show up in that sweet spot I showed before the upper, the upper uh, square. And for the AGRs, we just simply don't know as much. Um, so basically that's why you see that we've got the whole right-hand side, um, right-hand side here. So I would say that's uh, pretty good progress compared to many nations around the world. Next slide. So here is a map showing the MPAs and AGRs. MPAs are protecting about four and a half percent of China's marine and coastal habitats. And these are shown, MNRs are blue, SMPAs are black, and marine parks are red. <clears throat> and the AGRs account for quite a large percent of China's waters, eight and a half percent. And um, so altogether, we have about 13% of China's waters that are protected by one or the other forms of area-based conservation. So depending on what percent of the OECMs, I'm sorry, what percent of the AGRs qualify as OECMs, it may in fact be the case that China has met or exceeded the Aichi target or SDG target 14 of 10% coverage. Next slide. So here we're um, getting into the ecological representativeness part of the talk, and I will turn the table over to Johnny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. So I'll take it from here. So on this question of ecological representativeness, uh, the main research question is what uh, habitats are MPAs and AGRs in China protecting and where they're, where do the do gaps seem to be the most prevalent? Uh, and the first question there is to identify how can we um, identify what are the representative habitats that we're going to be looking at? Uh, and that's very much dependent on the type of and amount of environmental data that we have. Uh, and that was a challenge, of course. Um, a lot of there's a lot of uh, lack of a lot of data gaps as far as different environments and sediment types within China. Uh, and we were primarily reliant on uh, remote sensing, which is basically satellite data. So looking at sea surface temperature or chlorophyll concentrations as a measure of productivity. Uh, and sea surface salinity over a 10 year period, as well as geomorphic uh, data sets, which have also been used in ecological representativity studies, uh, which included uh, basically benthic data looking at the seafloor, um, uh, analyzing across ecologically significant depth zones and where available special uh, underwater features like undersea canyons or seamounts that are particularly important. Uh, and even though we looked at looking at this type of information was actually quite consistent, though, with the types of uh, information, environmental information available used in these types of ecological representative uh, representativity studies uh, in other countries around the world. Um, and one of the reasons is that we have to be consistent with the environmental information that we have uh, on a national scale here. Uh, we also were able to get a slightly more nuanced perspective on what exactly is within each MPA uh, based on looking at the conservation objectives, which I'll uh, address when we go through the results. But for now, I'll focus on uh, how we analyze different habitats and environmental conditions in China's waters uh, through these, uh, this remote sensing and uh, geomorphic uh, data set information. So a couple of years ago, we published a study where we identified representative uh, groups of marine protected areas on the global scale based on uh, characteristics like age, size, no-take area, uh, things like that. And used it to segment MPAs around the world in two groups that were representative of the diversity of these characteristics on a global scale. And then we thought, why don't we use that approach uh, to identify statistically distinct uh, and characteristically representative uh, habitats across China's waters based on the, uh, that satellite information and benthic information that we were able to access. And we would later find out that other studies on ecological representativity had done similar approaches. But the way we did it was a two-step approach by combining what's called a principal components analysis 
and it came means cluster analysis, which I won't go into detail now, but it was a test that we ran across three different ecologically significant depth categories, uh, shallow waters, uh, less than 10 meters, medium depth waters at 10 to 50 meters and deeper waters at 50 meters plus. And then we also considered uh, waters beyond the continental shelf as a distinct area. And we ran that test across those three main depth categories uh, for sea surface temperature and average chlorophyll concentration at different locations across China's waters over the last 10 years. And those are represented in these uh, figures here on the right which is basically each point here is a location and the zeros here represent the average uh, for the entire study scope. Uh, sea surface temperature at the bottom, chlorophyll concentrations at the left. So for example, for this uh, purple uh, figure here, that basically was an area that had higher than average sea surface temperatures and lower than average uh, chlorophyll concentrations. Uh, compared to the, the, the average in China's waters. Uh, and these blobs, they might not seem like particularly meaningful at the moment, but these represent our uh, distinct habitats that we're gonna be analyzing uh, where, con where con uh, conservation seemed to be more concentrated uh, and where there were gaps in MPAs and, and AGRs. Uh, and it begins to come together when we look at, when we start plotting those spatially and we can see our habitats uh, starting to take shape here. And then we basically put all those puzzle pieces together and overlay the estimated extents of these MPAs and AGRs. And we can see here, starts to, the logic starts to flow here that this is basically an overlap analysis of where different, the, the different types of habitats that we've identified here, where uh, MPAs and AGRs tend to overlap them or when there wasn't perfect overlap, which ones they were at least nearest to. Uh, so what we found when looking across first, at a more simple level, these three different depth zones, we know that about 13% of China's waters are uh, covered by MPAs and AGRs. Uh, and when looking across these different depth zones, we see that over 15% of shallow uh, habitats were protected, the majority of that by marine protected areas. For mid-depth habitats, similar about in the range of about 15%, but we see the dominance shift from MPAs to AGRs. And then when we go into deeper habitats, we see a uh, sharp drop off in protection overall and even more increasingly, but proportionately even more increasingly dominated by AGRs. And then for waters beyond the continental shelf, which within China include important habitat areas like uh, undersea canyons and seamounts, there was uh, no protection at all. And going now to bring in a, a, a additional level of complexity here, and we can start to observe the patterns in protection, not just across those different depth zones, but across the habitats within those depth zones. Mm -hmm. So this idea of ecological representativity is not, necess it's not necessarily about how much of each uh, habitat is protected in terms of area, but the proportion of that habitat that is protected. And most studies have adopted the approach where if we wanna protect 10% of the ocean, at least 10% of each habitat should be protected in those areas that are particularly important, perhaps more than that. Uh, so what we see here on this figure is on the left, we have the percent call, um, axis, which is basically the percent of each habitat's total area that is protected by MPAs and AGRs. And on the right, the uh, the actual raw area in square kilometers. So for these shallow habitats and the blue columns here uh, correspond to the, the percent access and the, the red and pink to area in kilometers squared. But what we see for these shallower habitats is that these were, you could say fairly well represented in that more than 10%, significantly more than 10% of each habitat was protected by MPAs and AGRs. Again, typically the majority by MPAs and, and no-take uh, marine nature reserves. Uh, and it was, so it was quite consistent across habitats within uh, these shallower uh, depth zones. Moving towards midwater habitats, we start seeing a little bit less consistency here. Still fairly good amount of protection, but again, increasingly dominated by, by AGRs. And then it's really moving towards the depth, the deeper waters where we see uh, 
a really a, a, an additional level of um, of inconsistency and levels of protection across habitats. And again, the majority dominated by AGRs, but even what area is protected by MPAs here tends to be primarily by special marine protected areas, which we know are less restrictive than marine nature reserves. Uh, and we also observe that for, it's not reflected here directly, but across these medium depth and deeper water habitats is that areas, the habitats that had the highest representation were also the ones that tended to have the highest chlorophyll concentrations indicating productivity of those, of those ecosystems. Moving towards this idea of conservation objectives. So when we were reviewing a lot of the materials and compiling the data set, we noticed that a lot of the uh, kind of profiles, if you will, for marine protected areas uh, and AGRs listed specific conservation objectives, but not all of them did. Uh, so what we did was we compiled data set as well for these conservation objectives, uh, including the ones that were reported as well as uh, ones that we observed in reviewing these. And what were these conservation objectives? It was kind of, it was very inconsistent across different marine protected areas, but these basically reflected uh, particularly important priorities. And that might be a specific species like the Chinese white dolphin. It might be a group of species like let's say clams in general without necessarily specifying a, a given species, or it might be something that wasn't directly related to biodiversity like uh, ecotourism or geological features, things like that. Uh, but considering the, the, we thought this was really valuable information, but it was difficult to compare directly. So what we decided to do was to aggregate this information uh, over two levels. So we have aggregate level one, which is like uh, looking at just fin fish in general, shellfish in general, uh, and just broader uh, marine ecosystems that were listed as conservation objectives like mangroves or wetlands or coral reefs. And then we had a second level of aggregation, which was a little bit more detailed where we didn't look at the exact species level. Like for example, uh, different MPAs, you know, included different species of horseshoe crabs among the conservation objectives, but we thought, okay, let's at least look at the level of horseshoe crabs in general. So kind of the group of species level. Uh, so that would include, for example, maybe forage fish, flatfish in general, lobsters, clams, so on and so forth. And when we look at the results for like the, just is only in the study we, we go through in the paper, we, we list more than this, but just for the purposes of this presentation, these are the top five uh, conservation objectives for that first level, that more general level of aggregation in terms of area protected, as well as frequency across MPAs and AGRs. And we begin to notice some patterns here, not surprisingly for AGRs, uh, finfish and shellfish, uh, these were the main focus here, these being um, areas for you know commercial fishing, typically for 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 uh, focusing on on um, these fishery resources. And when we look at the MPAs, especially the the marine nature reserves, we see greater diversity among charismatic megafauna. Uh, for example, birds, marine mammals, uh, specific ecosystems like wetlands and mangroves. And looking at the species level. That's, kind of, that's corroborated by looking at the actual, not the exact species, but the kind of groups of species where, uh, for example, croaker and especially yellow croaker are a very uh, highly commercially significant species within China. Uh, and these were among the most popular uh, groups of species within the AGRs as were cutlass fish, also known as hair tail, uh, clams, shrimps and prawns, lobsters and others that are uh, commercially significant. And then looking at that second level, level of aggregation for MPAs, we see again the types of species of charismatic megafauna that were particularly frequent among conservation objectives, including uh, seals, spotted seals, Chinese white dolphin. Um, there were at least, I think, about at least 12 MPAs where Chinese white dolphin was a uh, priority. Uh, other priorities included among these conservation objectives included horseshoe crabs, uh, forest fish were common, and of course different uh, species of, of birds, uh, including egrets and various seagulls. Uh, and also those highly important e uh, ecosystems that are again in kind of those shallow habitats close to the coastline, also often common among uh, ecotourism, including mangroves, coral reefs, and coastal wetlands. Another uh, output of this research that I'd like to point out uh, is an online map of uh, 
our data set basically represented here uh, on the Stony Brook website produced uh, by one of our co-authors, Maria Grima. And this is open to the public. You can navigate it. You can click on the specific uh, MPAs and AGRs here and see the metadata, the name, area, uh, and conservation objectives that we observe for each one, um, as well as look at the, the different habitats here a little bit more closely. You can zoom in. The resolution is quite high. Uh, and there's a link at the end of the presentation uh, to where that map is located. Uh, but moving towards our main conclusions here, so as Alan pointed out, this we produced the first uh, comprehensive publicly available database on area-based marine protection in China. Uh, and through analyzing that, we found that China may have achieved uh, the CBD's IEG target 11 in protecting 10% of its marine and coastal ecosystems, depending on the extent to which AGRs qualify as OECMs. Um, but within the MPA network specifically, we do find that at least two thirds of that network is uh, fully no take, which is uh, a major strength. But we did also identify major gaps in protection for some types of ecosystems, which led us to uh, develop a series of recommendations here. And those include uh, particularly extending protection uh, in those more offshore pelagic ecosystems, especially by no-take MPAs and especially in, in tropical and subtropical regions. Um, furthermore, we also found that it would be important to add protections to some of these important deep water features, including canyons and seamounts. Um, but even though shallower areas had more consistent representation, um, that doesn't mean that it's not important to still evaluate further need and opportunities for additional protection in shallower areas, considering the extent of coastal development in the country, as well as the importance of a lot of those coastal ecosystems to biodiversity and carbon sequestration. Uh, and then also long term, it's going to be really important to develop long term monitoring programs to evaluate effectiveness uh, and modify MPA management as needed, especially in the climate change future. And one of the important adaptations there to point out is that because you're looking at a network that historically has been focused on more towards the immediate coastline, as identified by the need to extend protection to more offshore areas, that might also require kind of different management approaches and frameworks and protocols. And that's something that perhaps might need to be um, adapted and developed within the governance and management frameworks in China. And lastly, this is a very relevant and an opportune time for really broad scale uh, improvements to the uh, area based protection network in China, uh, both with the potential uh, passing of 30 by 30 or some degree of extension of, of international marine protection targets, as well as the fact that China is currently undergoing an institutional reform of its marine protected area network, which has also been a, uh, a subject of, of some of our research in the country. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over, back over to Ellen for some final closing remarks. Thanks very much, Johnny. So um, I hope you've enjoyed listening to the presentation. We look forward to the Q&A. Again, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Lenfest Ocean Program for this project, um, all the co-authors of the paper. And we, we also have in the paper, in the detailed acknowledgments, the names that go along with these institutions. But um, just to show the amount of consultation that we did and the number of different institutions within China that were involved in pulling together this database, also in helping us with the logistics of conducting the site visits. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so I guess, Kayla, over to you to moderate the Q&A. All right, sounds great. And Ellen and John, if I could ask you, if you have those links on hand quickly available, if you just wanna add those into the chat so that people have access to those, um, we will, certainly like to share that with you. And then we'll also be sharing that in the follow-up email with the webinar recording as well. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen again. Actually, you know what, Ellen, I'm gonna keep yours up if that's okay, because yours has a lot of information about 
um, contact information and the links to the chat. So okay, I'm going to keep yours up because that looks good. Okay. Um, so we have two questions. Well, we have three questions right now, but two are sort of focused on uh, the classifications and like categories of MPAs and marine nature reserves and you know AGRs and all of the different alphabet soup letters that you <laughs> <laughs> mentioned during the presentation, uh, which was really really great to hear about all of those things. Um, but I I want to ask those two questions first. Um, and the first one I want to ask is more about you know how the government classifies these things. So. Are marine nature reserves, special marine protected areas, and marine parks designations at the national or central government level versus the provincial? And do these fall under the Ministry of Natural Resources? Okay, so uh, I'll take that one. Um, so they don't, they're not all national. And in fact, one way to look at how most MPAs evolved within the country is they evolved from the bottom up. Um, they, they kind of develop locally, and then as you look at them, there's now more and more of a structure to bring them together into a national framework. Um, so there are some that are, that are designated at the national level, and quite a number of them are designated at the provincial level, level. and then it goes down to even smaller and smaller geographic areas. So, um, so now they are... Um, all, of, all of the different types of MPAs are managed by a single ministry at this point. That wasn't the case just a few years ago while we were actually conducting the study. Great, thanks. Um, and then this is more of, you know, based on your opinions and maybe some of the observations through site visits. But given that some marine nature reserves are only for specific endangered species and not the whole ecosystem, might these better qualify as OECM, similar to what you described for AGRs? Let me start out on that one, and then Johnny, you can chime in. Um, thank you for asking this question, because it gives me the chance to do a better job of explaining the conservation objectives. Um, so if you look at a particular MPA, what we found is that they typically had many conservation objectives listed, some as many as a dozen, um, and it varied a lot from um, MPA to MPA, as Johnny pointed out. So they all um, do have the objective of, the primary objective of the conservation of nature. They do meet that. Um, but some, but they also list particular species of interest that may be endangered species. And we gave an overview of those. So it's, a, it's kind of like a second level of objective that's mentioned for many of these. Unlike the, um, so, so again, you have different ministries now managing the marine protected areas and the AGRs which some of which may be OECMs, about alphabet soup. Um, so the AGRs are managed by the fisheries agency and the primary objective for the AGRs is fisheries production, to enhance fisheries production. And it's often the case that to enhance fisheries production and to maintain sustainable fisheries, you may wanna protect certain habitats, certain areas um, in order to do that. And that's where the potential for these to be OECMs comes in. So I hope that helps clarify um, the di very big differences between the, the objectives of each type. Johnny, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I guess, I guess to add a couple of examples here. So for a lot of cases, some of these conservation objectives might have been kind of treated perhaps more as like flagship species or features um, to help kind of promote the attraction of the MPA potentially, but also, Again, those conservation objectives, those are you know, things of special importance, but it was quite clear even when, like let's say for example, some reserves were uh, called in, say a dugong reserve, it was quite clear in the material that we were looking at that it wasn't just for the dugongs, it was also to protect the entire habitat in which those dugongs were residing. So therefore uh, it is, the main focus there is comprehensive biodiversity protection of the entire, uh, of comprehensive protection of all biodiversity there within the ecosystem, including the seagrass beds that are important food sources and things like that. 
Thank you both. Um, our next question, do you all have a sense of what percent of these areas have active research and monitoring plans in place? Uh, great question. The site visits really helped us to see the variety of different forms of research and monitoring plans that were in place. I, I can't say that we did enough. You know, we, we only looked at, we only looked at, we looked at um, between 25 and 30 different places and they differed quite a bit. So we, we definitely didn't look at them all. And it's therefore we can't really talk about a percent. But um, I, I would have to say that I was impressed with how much research is going on how much enforcement activity is going on in, in almost all the places. Um, the other thing that really st stuck out in my mind was how much, and this isn't true of all of them, so many of the MNRs um, are closed to people. They're very high security, and we had to get special permission to visit them. Um, so they're not open to the public, but some of them, some of the MNRs and MPAs are open to the public, or if they're not, they have outside of them public information facilities, interpretive centers, um, some of them, well, a lot, a lot of them do. A lot of these MPAs bring in school groups to teach them about the biodiversity in the area and particular species. So there are a lot of outreach activities, a lot of management activities, a lot of research activities. What um, there, there seem to be more in the way of activity than evaluation. And I think that that, um, that is an area that in general could be strengthened within China. So they do, for example, in, with Chinese white dolphins, um, there are areas where there are Chinese white dolphins within the MPA and they'll go out and do regular surveys and count, count them, but they are not really doing a comprehensive evaluation and changing the management in any way at this point. So um, I, again, I, ho I hope that that helps shed some light on your question. Awesome, thank you. Um, so this question, it might be a little too soon to have a full response to this question, um, but maybe through some of your conversations uh, with your research collaborators or any managers that you met with on your site visits, could you give a little bit of insight into, you know, any kind of response that you've received from this study, uh, particularly from the government agencies in China, like MNR and MARA, or MARA? Yeah. Um... So I would definitely answer that by saying it's a little it's a little bit too early to tell. The study really just came out. And um, you know, I've heard more from the scientific community in China and a very positive response. That's great. Um, all right. And for our next question, so we have two questions that are sort of uh, trying to understand surveillance and enforcement at these sites a little bit better. So could you give a little bit of background on that, you know, any information that you might have based off of your, your observations? So, um, you know, another thing that's, that was very clear is that not all of these MPAs have the same amount of resources or the same amount of staffing or the same amount of ability to, um, to do the work that they need to do. And that was, that was something that we saw. Some of them are very well-funded. And some, sometimes that's because um, they can even, well, they, they just have so much public support and they're in areas where there's uh, a lot of resource available. Others are less well-resourced financially. And so I would say that, um, you know, where there's a lot of financial resource, there's a lot more in the way of enforcement and um, where there's less, there's less. I mean, it makes sense. So um, hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, is there an active in-country campaign to protect certain endangered marine species in China? 
Um, you know, this, this would really be a better question um, for people who work on endangered species in China. So, um, I mean, I know that there, there have been campaigns, for example, to work on, on shark conservation and an active, there were active campaigns, which may still be going on, on, um, you know, asking people to not serve shark fin soup at government functions and at banquets. Um, so there definitely are species specific campaigns, but that wasn't really within the scope of our study to evaluate. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right, so great presentations, Alan and John. Did you see any similarity or difference between China and US in terms of managing MPAs and fishery conservation areas? For example, AGRs and essential fish habitats? And do you have any insights on improving the institutional coordination and ecological connectivity across MPAs and OECMs? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, one big similarity is that, again, we have the separation of the agencies that are managing marine protected areas and that are managing fisheries. And I would say a few years ago, we didn't give much thought to that because um, people were looking at only marine protected areas as entities that would count towards meeting these um, protection goals. Now that it's been determined that OECMs count and that some of them might be fishery-based, not all of them would be fishery-based, by the way. I mean, you know, we talked about other types of situations that could result in an OECM besides fisheries. But I think that there's, there's more and more importance in having more collaboration, both in the US and in China. We, we have a very similar situation here um, where there's just not as much collaboration and discussion as, as there could be. Another uh, observation I'd point out is that one area in which the management and governance really of, of MPAs in China is distinct is, and, and surprised me in some ways is that it's, it's more of a the development of the network across governance levels really almost takes like a bottom-up approach where a lot of MPAs start at the municipal or local level and then they have a promotion system where if they perform well, they get promoted to the provincial and eventually the national level, at which point, as Ellen pointed out, they're granted more resources as they get to the national level. But that also creates a lot of potential uh, inequality in the resources across a lot of these marine protected areas, because for example, some of the ones in poor municipalities or provinces, it perhaps might be more difficult for them to attain uh, certain kind of performance levels uh, to attain, to reach those that provincial or national management level in which they're then given resources. So they're additional resources. So there's kind of potentially a, uh, it's an interesting approach, uh, but it's one that could perhaps lead to some uh, MPAs kind of getting 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 stuck uh, where they are particularly in, in, in some of those poorer areas. Another thing to mention is that things continue to change in China. This, the reform that's going on, the MPA reform, the, um, a lot, of, a lot of things are happening with conservation in China. And there, there are proposals that not only would some MPAs be promoted from the provincial to the national level and even lower ones, but that there could be some of these very small MPAs that are located near one another might be encompassed by a bigger area and put into a new MPA that would be larger so um, it's really, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very active time and there are a lot of things that are changing. Great, thank you. Um, so we're getting close to the end to a full hour um, and we've had a lot of really great questions. So I just wanna thank the audience for typing those in and engaging with us. I really appreciate it. Um, I do wanna ask one more question before we all jump off. Uh, that kind of is about continuing and next steps. Uh, so will you be taking next steps to evaluate MPAs and AGRs against frameworks such as the MPA guide? So that's, uh, that's a really good question. We're currently in, in discussions um, to, to basically start work in that direction because we think it's really important. And um, particularly with the AGRs, I would say, um, 
you know, there's a lot less, we, we were able to get a lot less information and their importance as potential OECMs. Um, maybe, maybe taking something like the MPA guide and coming up with something that is analogous for OECMs and in particular fishery OECMs. So these are definitely areas that our group at Stony Brook um, are interested in looking at and are in discussions about. Fantastic. So are marine nature reserves, special marine protected areas and marine parks designations at the national or central government level versus the provincial? And do these fall under the Ministry of Natural Resources? Okay, so uh, I'll take that one. Um, so they don't, they're not all national. And in fact, one way to look at how most MPAs evolved within the country is they evolved from the bottom up. Um, they, they kind of develop locally. And then as you look at them, there's now more and more of a structure to bring them together into a national framework. Um, so there are some that are, that are designated at the national level and quite a number of them are designated at the provincial level, level. And then it goes down to even smaller and smaller geographic areas. So, um, so now they are, um, all, of, all of the different types of MPAs are managed by a single ministry at this point. That wasn't the case just a few years ago while we were actually conducting the study. Great, thanks. Um, and then this is more of, you know, based on your opinions and maybe some of the observations through site visits, but given that some marine nature reserves are only for specific endangered species and not the whole ecosystem, might these better qualify as OECM, similar to what you described for AGRs? Let me start out on that one and then Johnny, you can chime in. Um, thank you for asking this question because it gives me the chance to do a better job of explaining the conservation objectives. Um, so if you look at a particular MPA, what we found is that they typically had many conservation objectives listed, some as many as a dozen, um, and it varied a lot from um, MPA to MPA, as Johnny pointed out. So they all um, do have the objective of the primary objective of the conservation of nature. They do meet that. Um, but, some, but they also list particular species of interest that may be endangered species. And we gave an overview of those. So it's, a, it's kind of like a second level of objective that's mentioned for many of these. Unlike the, um, so, so again, you have different ministries now managing the marine protected areas and the AGRs which some of which may be OECMs, but alphabet soup. Um, so the AGRs are managed by the fisheries agency and the primary objective for the AGRs is fisheries production, to enhance fisheries production. And it's often the case that to enhance fisheries production and to maintain sustainable fisheries, you may wanna protect certain habitats, certain areas um, in order to do that. And that's where the potential for these to be OECMs comes in. So I hope that helps clarify um, the di very big differences between the, the objectives of each type. Johnny, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I guess, I guess to add a couple of examples here. So for a lot of cases, some of these conservation objectives might have been kind of treated perhaps more as like flagship species or features um, to help kind of promote the attraction of the MPA potentially, but also, Again, those conservation objectives, those are you know, things of special importance, but it was quite clear even when, like let's say for example, some reserves were uh, called in, say a dugong reserve, it was quite clear in the material that we were looking at that it wasn't just for the dugongs, it was also to protect the entire habitat in which those dugongs were residing. So therefore uh, it is, the main focus there is comprehensive biodiversity protection of the entire, uh, of comprehensive protection of all biodiversity there within the ecosystem, including the seagrass beds that are important food sources and things like that. Great, thank you both. Um, our next question 
do you all have a sense of what percent of these areas have active research and monitoring plans in place? Uh, great question. The site visits really helped us to see the variety of different forms of research and monitoring plans that were in place. I, I can't say that we did enough. You know, we, we only looked at we only looked at we looked at um, between 25 and 30 different places and they differed quite a bit. So we we definitely didn't look at them all. And it's therefore we can't really talk about a percent. But um, I, I would have to say that I was impressed with how much research is going on, how much enforcement activity is going on in, in almost all the places. Um, the other thing that really st stuck out in my mind was how much, and this isn't true of all of them, so many of the MNRs um, are closed to people. They're very high security, and we had to get special permission to visit them. Um, so they're not open to the public, but some of them, some of the MNRs and MPAs are open to the public. Or if they're not, they have outside of them public information facilities, interpretive centers, um, some of them, well, a lot, a lot of them do. A lot of these MPAs bring in school groups to teach them about the biodiversity in the area and particular species. So there are a lot of outreach activities, a lot of management activities, a lot of research activities. What um, there, there seem to be more in the way of activity than evaluation. And I think that that, um, that is an area that in general could be strengthened within China. So they do, for example, in, with Chinese white dolphins, um, there are areas where there are Chinese white dolphins within the MPA, and they'll go out and do regular surveys and count, count them, but they are not really doing a comprehensive evaluation and changing the management in any way at this point. So um, I, again, I, ho I hope that that helps shed some light on your question. Awesome, thank you. Um, so this question, it might be a little too soon to have a full response to this question, um, but maybe through some of your conversations uh, with your research collaborators or any managers that you met with on your site visits, could you give a little bit of insight into, you know, any kind of response that you've received from this study, uh, particularly from the government agencies in China, like MNR and MARA, or MARA? Yeah. Um... So I would definitely answer that by saying it's a little it's a little bit too early to tell the study really just came out. And um, you know, I've heard more from the scientific community in China and a very positive response. That's great. Um, all right. And for our next question, so we have two questions that are sort of, uh, trying to understand surveillance and enforcement at these sites a little bit better. So could you give a little bit of background on that? You know, any information that you might have based off of your, your observations? So, um, you know, another thing that's, that was very clear is that not all of these MPAs have the same amount of resources or the same amount of staffing or the same amount of ability to um, to do the work that they need to do, and that was that was something that we saw. Some of them are very well funded, and some sometimes that's because um, they can even well they they just have so much public support, and they're in areas where there's uh, a lot of resource available. Others are less well resourced financially, and so I would say that. Um, you know, where there's a lot of financial resource, there's a lot more in the way of enforcement and um, where there's less, there's less. I mean, it makes sense. So um, hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, is there an active in-country campaign to protect certain endangered marine species in China? Um, you know, this, this would really be a better question 
um, for people who work on endangered species in China. So, um, I mean, I know that there, there have been campaigns, for example, to work on, on shark conservation and an active, there were active campaigns, which may still be going on, on, um, you know, asking people to not serve shark fin soup at government functions and at banquets. Um, so there definitely are species specific campaigns, but that wasn't really within the scope of our study to evaluate. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right, so great presentations, Alan and John. Did you see any similarity or difference between China and US in terms of managing MPAs and fishery conservation areas? For example, AGRs and essential fish habitats? And do you have any insights on improving the institutional coordination and ecological connectivity across MPAs and OECMs? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, one big similarity is that, again, we have the separation of the agencies that are managing marine protected areas and that are managing fisheries. And I would say a few years ago, we didn't give much thought to that because um, people were looking at only marine protected areas as entities that would count towards meeting these um, protection goals. Now that it's been determined that OECMs count and that some of them might be fishery-based, not all of them would be fishery-based, by the way. I mean, you know, we talked about other types of situations that could result in an OECM besides fisheries. But I think that there's, there's more and more importance in having more collaboration, both in the US and in China. We, we have a very similar situation here um, where there's just not as much collaboration and discussion as, as there could be. Another uh, observation I'd point out is that one area in which the management and governance really uh, of MPAs in China is distinct is, and, and surprised me in some ways is that it's, it's more of a the development of the network across governance levels really almost takes like a bottom-up approach where a lot of MPAs start at the municipal or local level and then they have a promotion system where if they perform well, they get promoted to the provincial and eventually the national level, at which point, as Ellen pointed out, they're granted more resources as they get to the national level. But that also creates a lot of potential uh, inequality in the resources across a lot of these marine protected areas, because for example, some of the ones in poor municipalities or provinces, it perhaps might be more difficult for them to attain uh, certain kind of performance levels uh, to attain, to reach those that provincial or national management level in which they're then given resources. So they're additional resources. So there's kind of potentially a, uh, it's an interesting approach, uh, but it's one that could perhaps lead to some uh, MPAs kind of getting 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 stuck uh, where they are particularly in, in, in some of those poorer areas. Another thing to mention is that things continue to change in China. This, the reform that's going on, the MPA reform, the, um, a lot, of, a lot of things are happening with conservation in China. And there, there are proposals that not only would some MPAs be promoted from the provincial to the national level and even lower ones, but that there could be some of these very small MPAs that are located near one another might be encompassed by a bigger area and put into a new MPA that would be larger so um, it's really, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very active time and there are a lot of things that are changing. Great, thank you. Um, so we're getting close to the end to a full hour um, and we've had a lot of really great questions. So I just wanna thank the audience for typing those in and engaging with us. I really appreciate it. Um, I do wanna ask one more question before we all jump off. Uh, that kind of is about continuing and next steps. Uh, so will you be taking next steps to evaluate MPAs and AGRs against frameworks such as the MPA guide? So that's, uh, that's a really good question. We're currently in, in discussions um, to, to basically start work in that direction because we think it's really important. And um, particularly with the AGRs, I would say, um, 
you know, there's a lot less, we, we were able to get a lot less information and their importance as potential OECMs. Um, maybe, maybe taking something like the MPA guide and coming up with something that is analogous for OECMs and in particular fishery OECMs. So these are definitely areas that our group at Stony Brook um, are interested in looking at and are in discussions about. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are at 11 a.m. Eastern, so I do want to jump off and give everyone a chance to go to their next meetings, which they probably have because it's a very busy time of year. Uh, but before we do, I want to thank Ellen and John very much for your work on this project and also uh, sharing these results with us today. This was really informative, great presentation. And also thank you to everyone who attended this. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email with the recording very soon uh, once we have that, and then we'll also include all of these links. If we didn't get to your question, please reach out to us. Um, we would definitely love to hear from you. Uh, Ellen and John's information is on the screen, and then you can also, I'll be emailing everyone, so you'll have my contact information as well. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Ellen and John, and have a great day. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.